All right. Uh, good morning and happy new year to everyone. Welcome to the first um, Real Assets Committee meeting of January of uh, 2022. Uh, I don't know if this is actually the first committee committee meeting of all the meetings through there, but um, um, from that perspective, but welcome everyone. And then uh, a special um, welcome, which means that I'm no longer the uh, the freshman uh, on the uh, group to new trustee uh, Michael Miller. Uh, welcome. So it's always have has uh, someone nice to uh, to welcome new to the group. Um, Michael, did you want to? I know you're off screen. I'm not sure if you're if you're still. Do you want to just take a moment, real quick, to uh, briefly introduce yourself, and then we'll get into the order of the business. He might have stepped away. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll give him a chance to when we come back. Um, like. Should I go ahead with uh, okay, just briefly introduce yourself and then we'll we'll fly into the regular business. Here, yes, good morning. My name is Michael Miller, and um, I am um, I was uh, uh, appointed from the uh, uh, second district uh, board of supervisors. My background is in banking and investments. I've had about forty years uh, as a public finance investment banker, and uh, and in banking, and I'm very glad to be here. Welcome. Thank you. All right, if you would, uh, Carol, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Jones. <clears throat> this meeting is being conducted as a virtual meeting, so I will do a roll call of all the trustees to confirm attendance. Mr. Knox? Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Ms. Sanchez? I'm here. Mr. Green? Here, good morning. Morning, Chair Jones? Here. Mr. Keo, Mr. Santos, on the four. Ms. Greenwood, Mr. Miller, I am here. Mr. Kelly, Joe. Staff participating in today's meeting include Principal Investment Officer James Rice. Senior Investment Officer Scott Drazel, Investment Officers Pushpom Jane and Daniel Joy, Senior Investment Analyst Noah Damsky. Trustees, if you have a comment or question, please use the Zoom chat option. At this time, we ask all meeting participants to mute their mics until you already speak. And now, Chair Jones, we may proceed with the agenda. Okay. So, first item, of course, is the approval of the minutes from the December 8th meeting. Uh, any comments or amendments to it. If not, I'll take a motion to approve it with a roll call. Keith, I'll move it. Do I have a second? Yes. David, I'll, I'll second it. I think that was Gina with the second. Right. Okay, Carol, go ahead with the... Uh... Mr. Knox? Aye. Ms. Sanchez? Aye. Mr. Jones? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. All right, um, Carol, do we have any public comments? Anything come in? We later? do not. Okay. All right, great, well then we'll move on to the uh, consent item um, on that piece. Do you, anything special that we need to do there? Uh, other than, uh, this is still the staff, the same, same information regarding the uh, emergency continuation stuff. Anything we need to do there before we move on to non-consent? We no? should have. Okay, good. So then let's get into the entree. It needs to be we need a motion. We oh, need I'm sorry. To, uh, yeah. Yep. So do we have a motion? I'll move it. Okay. I'll, I'll move it for, for the continuation of, of the extension. Oh. And okay. second? I'll second. Go ahead. Okay. So that's key. Go ahead. The roll on that one since there's just three of okay. us. Okay. Mr. Knox? Aye. Ms. Sanchez? I have to think about. I'm kidding. I <laughs> <laughs> and, Ms. and Chair Jones. Aye. Mm -hmm. Motion passes unanimously. All right. On to uh, item five, the non-consent item, and the main entree for today. Um, <laughs> let's get uh, Jim and your team uh, ready for the presentation on this. Um. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee and other trustees. Uh, today, we'll be presenting part two of the structure review for the real assets category. 
covering the parts which we excluded last time, which was real estate. And uh, the, what we're covering today is infrastructure, natural resources, commodities, and tips. The real estate structure review recommendations were advanced to the board in the committee last month and will be covered in the board meeting. So we're joined by our consultants from Alborn, Mark White and James Walsh. They provided their concurrence with the recommendations being proposed today. Um, and then joining the discussion from LaFera um, are Noah Damsky, Daniel Joy and Pushpen Jane. So Dale, if we could move to slide three, please. So the real assets category uh, in terms of its role within our LaSera portfolio is that it provides an intermediate risk return role in the investment structure. It's positioned between growth and risk mitigation like credit, um, but is higher than the middle on the risk return spectrum. Next slide, please. Uh, focusing on the evolution of the real asset structure. Um, the last time staff discussed real assets structure from the mid-cycle structure review last year, we discussed the transition from basically a program largely invested in public markets to one largely in private markets. Today's presentation continues that discussion, updating our progress in achieving this desired structure. We're gonna cover some changes that have occurred in the strategic asset allocation uh, and the emergence of opportunities in the energy transition space that may play a more meaningful role in the structure going forward. Next, please. Uh, given that one of the roles of the real assets category is to provide a source of inflation hedging to LaSera, uh, this slide shows the spike in inflation in the past year. We also show the recent employment levels, which are still below the pre-pandemic levels. So while we don't know if the Fed will be successful in tamping down inflation, while still trying to reach its employment objectives this year, we believe the real assets portfolio is well positioned to participate if rising prices in inflation persist. Uh, next, um, here we review the roles provided by the segments in the real asset category. All have varying contributions to the three main objectives, which are to diversify the portfolio from equity risk, provide a source of yield-based return, and act as an inflation edge. Next slide. Um, we, will have a, uh, we will have a fuller discussion of how we're addressing and evaluating ESG considerations in the real assets portfolio uh, as a separate item on today's agenda. Um, we believe that the ESG risks and opportunities in real assets can be somewhat unique relative to other asset categories at LaSera. And our process is designed to assess, monitor, and evaluate these considerations as a regular part of the process from manager selection to ongoing monitoring. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Noah, who's going to cover some of the elements of our structure. Thanks, Jim. Since we did our last structure review, we can move ahead. Uh, since we did our last structure review, we conducted an asset allocation study which led to changes in the strategy. This year, we will complete the transition to the new strategic asset allocation, which will ultimately increase infrastructure from three to 5% and decrease natural resources from four to 3% of the total fund, while TIPS will remain at 3%. And on to slide 11. Uh, the evolution of the real assets portfolio is demonstrated by the graph. Uh, highlights the public to private markets transition via the completion portfolio. Uh, in the bars on the left, the majority of the exposure is from public infrastructure and natural resources, which you can see in purple and red. And on the right, by 2026, the transition to private will be complete as public infrastructure and commodities are eliminated, while a piece of public natural resources remains. Skipping ahead to performance, uh, we can see strong real assets, X real estate returns year to date, one year and since inception uh, on the previous slide as of uh, September. And uh, here on slide 13, we break down performance since 2019 by public and private infrastructure and natural resources and tips. Uh, since that time, we have seen a full cycle, including the COVID dip in 2020 and the subsequent rebound. 
over the last year, there have been strong absolute returns and positive relative performance in public infrastructure and natural resources. Private natural resources, which consisted of one legacy oil and gas fund as of September and private infrastructure have lagged the benchmarks as expected. As we continue to make investments and the J curve is in effect, uh, fees dominate in the early years as funds are in the investment period. We expect the passive tips portfolio to roughly track the benchmark over time, although we have seen modest underperformance since inception. On to slide 14. Uh, this highlights a sequence and structure of how we construct the portfolio with the green boxes highlighting our accomplishments in recent years. In the last structure review, we highlighted how we would add more complex structures to the portfolio to enhance return expectations. The portfolio began with the completion portfolio and the plan to transition to private markets over time. And since then, we have invested over $1.8 billion across 11 funds, not only in open-ended and closed-ended fund structures, but also more nuanced ones, such as secondaries and club deals, and continue to evaluate co-investment opportunities regularly. We expect these complex structures to reward us over time with enhanced risk-adjusted returns. Skipping ahead, here on this slide, we wanna highlight the energy transition space, which has been noteworthy in its evolution since the last structure review. As a result of a lower carbon economy, new opportunities in energy transition uh, cover many segments of real assets. In metals and mining, increasing demand for renewable, renewables and EVs means more demand for inputs such as lithium and copper. We continue to monitor agriculture strategies focused on conservation and carbon reduction, while timberland is not a target as a result of low return expectations. Energy opportunities in renewable and transition fuels will be front and center in the coming years. Although we have allocated renewables within infrastructure, we will continue to explore how to best increase exposure. As we see decarbonization trends continue, we expect to see more opportunities and technologies such as battery storage and grid improvements to support these efforts going forward. Since, since some of these trends can be unproven strategies today, we will continue to evaluate the investments as a space evolves. Handing it off to Daniel. Uh, good morning, Chair and Trustees. Um, I'll walk you through our suggestions for um, the infrastructure portion of the portfolio. Um, on slide 17 here, uh, I'll, we're going to go over the um, role of infrastructure, mainly um, diversification and income generation. Um, and we achieve that through uh, purchasing contracted assets with uh, stable cash flows. Infrastructure uh, serves a role as a dampener in the portfolio, even though it may be correlated to equities. Uh, slide, next slide, please. Um, we've slightly changed versus our, our last structure review, our recommendation. Uh, previously, we had three buckets, core, value add and opportunistic. Uh, and we recommend that the board adopt a core versus non-core uh, bucketing this time around. And the reason is uh, we find it's, uh, it, it simplifies uh, the, the overall structure. Um, the difference uh, between core and non-core was mainly that core had low business risk. And, and finally, the, the line between um, value add and opportunistic was a little bit blurry. Um, in terms of the sectors that uh, come under the, the realm of infrastructure, we have four of them, energy, telecom, transportation, and social. With an energy that's mainly power generation and transmission, uh, midstream assets and water treatment. Uh, telecom is uh, generally data centers, cell towers and fiber networks. And transportation is usually toll roads, airports, seaports and bridges. Then finally, um, social, which is more availab availability based contracts um, around hospitals, schools and government buildings. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the, the suggestion for sector sizing, we have um, for energy and utilities, we think that's the main opportunity for infrastructure. Um, and we suggest uh, an allocation between a third and two thirds of our uh, total infrastructure allocation. Uh, telecom uh, has good infrastructure characteristics uh, and we foresee an opportunity that should be around a quarter to a third, which is why we recommend between 10 and 40%. Uh, transportation is an important part of infrastructure, but has um, more GDP exposure than the, the previous two. And so we recommend no more than a fourth uh, of the uh, exposure. Uh, and then finally, social is not a focus because of its potential overlap with real estate. And we recommend no more than 20%. Uh, 
In terms of geogra geographic split, um, we suggest the program uh, uh, focus on developed markets uh, with a stable jurisdiction and a stable currency um, in order to uh, achieve the role of a dampener to the portfolio. Um, and that would be achieved by a 50% allocation to US and Canada and a 50% allocation to Western Europe with a sleeve remaining for other jurisdictions depending on, on opportunity. Um, next slide, please. Uh, after our strategic asset allocation, we moved our infrastructure allocation to from 3% to 5%. Um, and we suggest reaching our target of 5% by 2020 with an intermediary target of 4% uh, by 2024. Um, this would imply that we would deploy about $1.4 billion per year for the next two years. Um, of course, we would adapt that deployment based on the opportunity set. Um, we suggest starting by the core open-ended funds, and that's what we've, we've done over the past uh, couple of years with a faster deployment rate um, that's achieved through those core and open-ended funds, which is two years versus the closed-end funds, which is usually around five years. And these core open-ended funds also enable us to have better liquidity to be able to rebalance in subsequent years. If you look at the graph on the bottom left, you can see our forecast for the core versus non-core split. And we explain mainly the difference between this core versus non-core by the difference, the, the difference in returns of each bucket. Core generally, um, we've assumed it returns 7% and non-core 13%. Um, and now I'll pass it on to Pushman. Thanks, Daniel. Good morning, Chair and Trustees. I'll walk you through the natural resources and commodities section, which is a segment of real assets. On slide 22. Uh, excuse me. Um, yeah. May I ask a question uh, before we move on on the infrastructure piece? Please go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. John, so go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, can, can we move the um, slide back one? Thank you. So uh, one more, if I may, please. Um, yeah, with regards to the geographic uh, allocation, uh, I understand that we are concentrating uh, in developed markets, and perhaps this question should be for uh, a consultant, uh, Mr. Walsh, if he's on the line. Uh, why, what is your view, Mr. Walsh, uh, with regards to emerging markets? Uh, I see we're not paying attention to that at all with regards to the infrastructure. Uh, is there's no opportunities in uh, emerging markets? Or what's your view? and, and uh, uh, as to we not um, invested in the emerging markets with regards to this particular strategy. Um, I'll defer to Mark in a moment. I think, I think just, just for clarity, I think my, my understanding here is that there, there is scope for emerging market exposure, because I think emerging market exposure is, is, is definitely part of the infrastructure universe. I think I just would go back to the point that Daniel made about being a dampener. Obviously, one of the things with emerging markets, you do get the, the currency uh, effect, which will negate some of the dampening effect. But I'll pass on to Mark to talk a little bit more about infrastructure itself. Yeah, the infrastructure uh, from a institutional investment perspective has largely been dominated in the developed markets. This is largely because most emerging markets have a strong government influence in the development of their infrastructure projects. As James mentioned, there is also a higher currency risk and often that currency volatility does not compensate for the political risk relative to the underlying performance profiles of these more stable assets. Also, there's another factor involved with respect to the correlation to the broader equity markets. As you recall, the diversification, yield, and inflation are the primary objectives of the uh, infrastructure portfolio. Inflation can often diverge when we're talking about emerging markets, as well as an increased correlation to the broader equity uh, universe on a global basis. Thus, the reason most of our institutional uh, clientele tend to keep a very low exposure to emerging markets and typically only explore emerging markets if return enhancement becomes part of their portfolio objective. So aside from the uh, uh, political, uh, geopolitical risk and obviously the effects, um, that's the reason we not invest in 
or looking at Africa or Latin America or other parts of the world? Yes, that's the primary reason, but there's also the reasons of increased correlations between emerging markets, uh, GDP activity and broader equity exposure uh, globally. Uh, emerging markets tend to do very well when the global economy is doing very well, which is also when the capital markets tend to be doing very well. So there's also a higher correlation there. The other issue is the vast majority of projects uh, in most of these jurisdictions are government uh, backed projects, usually with strong uh, influenced by development banks, which means from a return perspective, it's not necessarily fertile ground for institutional investors looking for returns. Great, thank you. I think uh, Daniel had his hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Santos. Um, I, I, I wanted to reiterate that, yes, as, as a dampener, that's why we, we don't have a focus on emerging markets, but we do have uh, the opportunity to invest there if we see um, you know, assets that would fit our portfolio. So it's not, it's not that we're completely excluding it. We just don't see it as a focus. Great, thank you very much. So we are looking at it opportunistically then. That's great, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're very welcome. Trustee Kelly, you had a question still? I did, thank you. I had a question on the previous slide, page 18. So here you talked about transportation and most of the items you listed are owned by governments or government related joint powers authorities. Can you give me an example of kind of what bridge or what tunnel we're buying? I mean, we're not going to buy the, the San Bernardino line to Metrolink or the Long Island Railroad here. So can you expand on that a little bit? Well, the, the examples that we have are, for example, the, the IFM owns the Indiana Toll Road or DIFF, for example, owns um, an underground tunnel uh, in, the, in, in Germany. That would be the type of sort of toll road that we would be considering. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, any other questions from uh, trustees? All right. If not, uh, I'm not sure who's up next, uh, Jim, in terms of your team. I think Chris Sam's going to continue on the natural resource discussion. Okay. 22. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Um, and so starting with uh, slide 22, where we talk about the natural resources portfolio overview, natural resources and commodities serve the three functions Jim identified at the start and within real assets, which is diversifying equity risk, providing yield-based returns, and serving as an inflation hedge. Uh, Dale, on, if you could move to the next slide. On slide 23, we show the current segments within natural resources, which, is, which are investments in metals and mining, agriculture, timber, and, and, and energy. Our current portfolio has an allocation of 4% of natural resources, which is an interim target, of which 2% is in the public markets natural resources benchmark and the other 2% is in the public markets commodities benchmark. That allocation, as Noah pointed out at start, will switch from 4% to 3% this year. And that will be primarily, and our transition envisions that moving primarily to private markets over the next five years. We expect to do that by allocating $500 million this year and then $350 million each year thereafter. Dale, if you could move to the next slide. On slide 24, we provide an overview of the different opportunity sets within the three segments of natural resources. So the table lays out metals and mining, ag, timberland, and energy. And then what are the opportunities between public and private markets in these three segments? Within metals and mining, we're primarily invested in the public markets and base and precious metals companies. And we expect that to transition to primarily private markets over the next five years, investing in private mining funds, similar, similar to the Orion mining fund that the board approved last year. In Ag Timberland, we are also invested primarily in public markets. And we started our program, investment program in a, second, in a farmland secondaries that we invested at the end of last year that the board had approved also. And we envision the opportunity set being in agribusiness primarily going forward. Within energy, we are invested in public markets and oil and gas companies and, and the broader energy infrastructure. And given the stranded asset risk within these segments, we envision that our private market opportunities in energy will be primarily in energy transition themes. And so how does this evolve? On slide 25, we show the transition from 
a public markets portfolio to a private markets portfolio. Given that the energy transition opportunity set is evolving, we have modeled this as 0.9% in public markets. And depending on the opportunities that come along, we will continue to evaluate private market opportunities. Uh, but for modeling purposes, we've left it as pu a public market investment. So over time, the portfolio transitions from 3% in private mar in public markets to primarily private markets with 0.9% modeled as a public market investment in energy. And if there are no questions on this section, I'll, move, I'll forward it to Noah to cover tips. Thanks, Pushpam. Uh, onto the following slide. Uh, returns and tips are tied to increases in inflation expectations, which has benefited performance in the last year. However, since real yields are negative, tips will be challenged to capture future increases in inflation expectations going forward. In 2021, we recently reduced the underweight and are close to the target allocation. Moving along to 29, um, with the potential of an emerging manager program, we propose an RFP later this year for a manager to build a, dele a delegated custom separate account of real assets funds uh, that are early in the fund life cycle. We would target up to 10% of infrastructure or about $400 million in one delegated manager that would invest in multiple managers. We believe this is an important next step in the evolution of the program and is consistent with TIDE. As the real asset segment grows, additional capacity rights and other LP friendly terms would allow us to efficiently deploy more capital over time in these opportunities. Uh, on to slide 30. Uh, since the last structure review, we are pleased with the evolution of the program. Uh, the completion portfolio has outperformed over the full cycle and commodities have served as a hedge against inflation and provided diversification. We have made meaningful progress in infrastructure and recently allocated to mining and farmland on the natural resources side. As yields remain relatively low, we are selective in core infrastructure while higher returning opportunities with commercial exposure are available. Given the risk of stranded assets, our outlook does not include oil and gas. Within agriculture, we're seeing more opportunities in agribusiness as opposed to traditional agriculture opportunities. And moving ahead, uh, in summary, we have successfully committed approximately $1.8 billion to private real assets, X real estate across various fund structures and updated benchmarks to more accurately reflect target portfolios. As we continue to transition from public to private in the completion portfolio, we will we'll continue to explore open and closed-ended funds, as well as more complex vehicles such as co-investments. Going forward, we continue to assess the evolving energy transition strategies and the future of energy. And back to Jim. Thank you, Noah. Um, on the next slide, we've summarized the recommendations uh, that we have in front of you today. Um, we've basically pulled the, uh, the guidelines that we are proposing managing both the infrastructure and natural resource portfolios under. Um, those are uh, those were pulled from the earlier sections of this presentation. Um, we've also added some uh, some uh, fund specific diversification guidelines at the bottom that help us either um, make sure that we're not over overly allocated to any one manager or being a significant part of any one fund. Um, on the next slide, so these those recommendations form the basis of today's recommendation. Those those uh, uh, constraints form the basis of the recommendation for today. Um, one of the things we're also adding to the recommendation is uh, adding a delegated authority to the CIO for re-ups into private funds that meet specific criteria. These are consistent with the criteria that we used for private equity as well as the real estate criteria that were advanced to the board from the committee uh, last month. And then um, finally on the following slide, uh, here again, we summarize the recommendations, including the guidelines shown on the prior two slides, the, um, uh, the delegated authority. Um, we also just are also summarizing here the pacing that we're expecting for the uh, both the infrastructure and natural resources side. 
we believe the fund sizes we'll be allocating to on infrastructure will be in the 125 to 250 million dollar range for non-core funds and 300 to 600 million for core funds. We believe it will be successful in achieving a 5% allocation in about four to five years. Um, and natural resources, we see allocation sizes of about 125 to 300 million. Again, we believe we'll be able to achieve our 3% allocation uh, in the next, in the same time period. Um, we also, as um, you may recall, we have a, uh, a, the ability to invest in co-invest, which we are selectively looking at opportunities as they uh, become available. Um, we believe that these will be attractive and will enable us to further align our portfolio with our objectives. We did not include the uh, the guidelines for the co-invest program, but if the board if the committee does advance this to the board, we will include uh, the same uh, the same parameters that were approved by the by the board in July of last year um, when it's presented to the board next month. So that concludes our comments, and we're happy to stand for any questions. Um, I just, hi, I just have one very, very, very tiny question. Um, and this is actually back on slide nine. Um, the, the, the fifth column difference versus interim, is that math right? <laughs> the, um, what is the difference to the allocation? Yeah, I think it's, it's supposed to be measuring the current allocation to the interim target. And the current allocation is the column allocation. Yes. So the difference between 6.2% and 6% should be positive 0.2, not negative 0 0.8. Just a curious, I just wanted to make sure I was looking at the right thing. Yes, I'm not sure why that's off. No. Okay, that's because very small, but, uh, but the math caught me off guard. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. The rest of it looked great, thank you. I also have a question. Um, Mr. Rice. Yes. With regards to uh, the CIO, dele CIO delegated authority of the $250 million, um, in one of the one of the proposals is for the board to be notified. Would that include the uh, consultant analysis that Mr. Grable or the CIO will use to make his um, decision whether to react or not. Yeah, the way that the, uh, the, the, the way that the delegated authority works for the co-invest is that we would- uh, well, this, this is, this is, this is re-ups, not co-invest. Oh, I'm sorry, the re-up, I'm sorry, this, I thought you were talking about co-invest. Yes, they would include, the, I'm sorry, yes, it would absolutely include the um, consultant's recommendation when we report to the board. Because the coin investing is going to be done in house, just like we do it in private equity. Yes, and, and therefore uh, we cannot have the the consultant opine on that because of the, the potential conflict of interest. Is that the rationale? Well, we, we do ask the consultant to give an opinion about that we follow the process that's laid out. So that's part of the um, the way the delegated authority works for co invest that the consultant gives an opinion about. Um, the process that we followed, not necessarily on the merits of the investment itself. Gotcha. But on reaps, we will get the full uh, report from the consultant. Yes. Thank you, sir. All right. I'm not seeing other any other questions. Any other questions from the uh, trustees either on the committee or those in attendance here? If not, uh, can we have a motion to recommend this to the full board? I'll, move I'll, move. I'll second. Good. Okay, Carol. Point of, point of order, Chair Jones, on, on the vote. Since oh, yeah. the fourth, since the fourth regular committee seat is vacant, Mr. Green can vote as alternate. Okay, Mr. Green, who I think might have stepped away for just a second per a note he sent me. Okay, okay. well. If he's absent, then I just, I just wanted to give him the opportunity. Make sure he had the opportunity. I missed that on the call. Thank you, Carol. 
All right, Mr. Knox. Aye. Ms. Sanchez. Aye. Um, Mr. Green. Chair Jones. Aye. Motion passes um, unanimously. Okay. Sorry, I had to step away there for a moment. My uh, neighbor's tree trimmer was perilously close to uh, <laughs> something of value out there, so I needed to to interrupt. So I apologize. Um, Okay, the, then I think the last component of this uh, before we get into staff review and go to the order for which I know John has uh, something he wanted to mention was um, Scott had an ESG uh, kind of integration update and next steps as it relates to the real, real assets. So uh, without further ado, Scott, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, good morning trustees, happy new year. Uh, to complement the committee's review of the real assets portfolio structure today, and last month's real estate structure review, we wanted to give a focused overview of Lucera's efforts to date to integrate ESG and real assets and the next steps that we're anticipating for the coming year. Uh, the committee will recall that a similar, similar report was scheduled for last month's committee meeting, but postponed for presentation until today's meeting. Uh, and as Jim mentioned, ESG can cover a wide variety of financial risks and opportunities in real estate, infrastructure, and other real assets such as ensuring internal controls over anti-bribery provisions, regulatory relations with permitting offices on infrastructure, real estate development, construction and building safety, tenant and community relations. Uh, so we wanted to go briefly over uh, some of the approaches we've been pursuing in recent years and identify a couple of discrete next steps that we anticipate bringing back at a future date for trustee consideration and possible action. So I'll move on to slide four. Uh, which highlights the key strategies, which include starting on the top left, uh, ESG assessments of every current and prospective mandate, uh, moving to the top right, collaborating with a global real estate ESG benchmarking outfit known by its acronym GRESBY to benchmark the ESG integration of individual mandates as well as the portfolio. On the bottom left, we have a responsible contractor policy that defines specific expectations of how firms manage ESG factors like legal compliance, workplace safety. And lastly, we're starting to use data analytics to inform a portfolio-wide view of ESG factors, namely climate risk and opportunity. Uh, we'll go over each of these in turn, uh, starting with slide five, which for most trustees might be a recap, but we want to briefly cover the level set for any newer voices around the table. Uh, consistent with all asset classes, Lacera is evaluating prospective and current mandates on the extent to which managers identify and manage ESG factors that are financially relevant to the specific mandate. That process includes looking at how the asset manager evaluates and integrates ESG into their due diligence, portfolio construction, property management, uh, the resources they bring to bear uh, to do that, and any information they can provide us of how their ESG efforts that they uh, describe help either safeguard or improve financial performance. As illustrated in the figure on the right, Lacera process, Lacera's process categorizes each of the mandates in a five point scale that's kind of intended to reflect the continuum uh, with higher scores indicating more systematic and robust in integration processes at the individual mandate, uh, but recognizing that ESG might evolve and improve over time at the mandate. Slide six includes the dashboards that reflect the team's current assessments of the real estate portfolio managers and the real assets managers to date, illustrating that most are attentive to ESG while all have room for improvement. And that includes the composite score in that last column, as well as how we break down some sub uh, components by intentionally evaluating and comparing managers the process is really aimed at helping to identify compelling practices, compare relative strengths and weaknesses, and deliberately consider how well managers are navigating ESG risks and opportunities that are particular to real assets uh, in order to help inform on a holistic basis which managers are best positioned to manage our capital. As we get more information and track managers over time, we expect our understanding of managers' ESG approaches will also evolve and become more nuanced. Uh, by way of example of that, you know, we flagged in this slide 
uh, that scores for the real assets managers tend to be more modest than real estate. This does reflect the team's more cautious approach for scoring the recent new fund commitments, which could be revised upwards as we revise the mandates, uh, monitor the mandates going forward. Uh, slide seven, please. This highlights a second approach rather briefly, uh, which, which is to benchmark the different mandates, mandates using the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. I know the committee is a fan of a good alphabet soup at ESG. So that Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark is often known by its acronym GRESBY or GRESB. Benchmarking is intended to be complementary to our ESG assessments of the individual mandates. And by way of background, GRESBY was founded by two prominent Dutch pension plans over a decade ago, APG and PGGM, uh, in order to set common reporting standards between asset owners and managers to measure, assess, and report on ESG integration, and to cut through the window dressing that sometimes comes into play in manager representations. How it works basically is that managers file ESG information and some data with Gresby on an annual basis, Gresby then analyzes, scores, and benchmarks that info against managers of similar mandates and avails the results to asset owners like Lacera. That benchmarking exercise covers both ESG practices as well as several specific data points such as energy efficiency and resource management of waste and, wa and water. Two years ago, Lacera asked our managers to consider participating in Gresby on a trial basis uh, as we've mentioned in some of the CIO reports to the board, eight of our managers agreed to do so, which included a mix of both U.S. and non-U.S. managers, a mix of some of the separate account managers and commingled funds, as well as a combination of some managers that were already familiar in reporting to Gresby and others that were brand new to it. Uh, slide eight captures the results of our two-year trial project and highlights that year over year, seven of the eight participating managers improved their Gresby scores. Uh, on a composite basis, Lacera's portfolio scored below peers on an asset-weighted basis, with a couple commingled funds outperforming, and Lacera's separate account managers in real estate, who are largely new to Gresby reporting, generally trailing. Uh, these scores may evolve and continue to improve with time, since in discussions with managers, all of the managers indicated that they're finding Gresby reporting to be useful since it helps them provide a roadmap and see a roadmap of how to identify areas for improvement and for newer firms to maybe formalize some of the ESG practices they've had in, in place before. Notably, each of the managers has specific plans to make improvements and has already told us that they plan to continue to, with Gresby reporting we're, we're heartened by the positive reactions from asset managers and have found Gresby reporting useful ourselves for both manager monitoring and benchmarking, as well as accessing some data points on carbon emissions and other measures that can be difficult to access in private asset classes. So in the near term, what we expect is to prepare more information and a recommendation for the trustees to consider more formally affiliating with Gresby going forward to use it as a part of the tool in our ESG toolbox. Uh, slide nine is a brief overview of Lacera's RCP. It's a responsible contractor policy. The RCP was adopted nearly 20 years ago and lays out expectations that firms who manage Lacera real estate mandates abide by certain core standards of legal compliance, workplace safety, and paying market rate wages and benefits in their contracting practices with construction firms and building service vendors such as uh, janitorial services and cleaning uh, crews. The spirit of the RCP is to encourage stable construction and building operations within the real estate portfolio by voting subcontractors who might violate applicable laws or statutes or safety standards, present reputational or operational risks for project delays or labor strife, and compete for contracts by possibly undercutting or underbidding competitive employment compensation in the local markets. Uh, with the real assets portfolio having evolved and grown over the past 20 years and more changes in discussion like last month's committee meeting, uh, we wanted to proactively take a look at the RCP to identify any areas that may merit modernizing or refinement to ensure that its intent matches the structure of the portfolio moving forward. 
We also note that Lacera's RCP is based off of a first generation template policy that was adopted by a number of public plans about 20 years ago in a largely similar format. A number of our peer plans have updated their RCPs in recent years from that similar policy. I think it might be worthwhile to conduct a periodic review. So in slide 10, you can see that in recent months, we've reviewed some peer policies, talked with industry groups and uh, other pension plans, and have done a preliminary gap analysis to identify several areas for possible revisions in the RCP. For example, our policy only applies to real estate. As this committee knows, uh, uh, the, the real asset portfolio has expanded to include infrastructure. Uh, other funds now generally include infrastructure in their RCP, and we think it might be worth considering uh, expanding the RCP to also incorporate infra. Uh, also, Lacera's current policy only applies to assets that are 100% owned by Lacera. As we enter into more commingled funds, uh, by the language of the policy, the RCP does not specifically apply. We have seen other public plans incorporate provisions that while they don't control commingled funds, try to encourage the commingled funds they're invested in to adhere by the same standards and expectations. So we think we might want to consider adding similar language as well. So here too, like the Gresby benchmarking work we just discussed, the team is planning to put together further details for trustees to review and consider modernizing the policy in the coming year. Uh, moving on to slide 11. Lastly, we note that we're now starting to access some data from third parties following procurements approved in recent years by the board that help illuminate and evaluate ESG risks, particularly related to climate change. In this slide on the top part, using location and other information about the current real estate holdings in Lucera's portfolio, MSCI analytics can highlight the prospective financial impact of certain weather related events on the portfolio value. The graph on the top highlights that coastal and river flooding are the most pronounced of the evaluated climate risks to date. We can use this to drill down further uh, in the data to identify which properties are most at risk and use that granular information to monitor and talk with our managers on what they're doing to mitigate uh, flood risks and other factors that could undermine portfolio value. And the bottom graph summarizes how regulatory changes to constrain climate change and achieve the Paris Agreement goals might also impact portfolio value. Here too, we can use these data points to identify specific properties and discuss mitigation or resiliency efforts at the property level with our managers, several of whom already have efforts uh, underway uh, to address climate risk. Uh, in slide 12, before you move on, actually, uh, Scott, I have a question on this. I know at one point you evaluated Verisk Mablecroft's uh, data for potential use because they're um, tied into Gresby uh, as well. Um, what Are you using that data or did you just choose not to use that and focus on MSCI data provision? So our, our current procurement uh, is with the MSCI analytics. Uh, we know a number of our managers are using other data providers, including Verisk and uh, 427. Uh, they take different approaches. Uh, and, and fortunately, we, you know, we've been able to uh, exchange some insights with managers on as the data, data evolves. Um, some of the MSAI data incorporates and identifies, I think right now, 10 specific climate factors. Uh, they are looking to further deepen, develop, and expand that. So as we're incorporating this data in real time, you know, we, we hope to also be able to uh, keep pace uh, with new factors as, as they emerge as well. And welcome if you, know, if you have any insights on other data outfits that we should- Yeah, I, I just pointed out, because we're using Maplecroft um, for some of our clients. And so it just, I was just curious. Great, thank you. All right, so on to slide 12. Uh, slide 12 is, intended to illustrate that all four of these strategies are meant to be synergistic. Uh, for example, the data analytics uh, that we just discussed and benchmarking through Gresby can help further inform our ESG assessments of each individual mandate. Uh, and whereas the responsible contractor policy is intended to set some baseline expectations, 
Grasby Benchmarking aims to encourage continuous improvement and more aspirational refinement uh, as ESG evolves in the marketplace. So uh, in slide 13, we summarize some of the key next steps, uh, which include presenting further information about Gresby for the committee and board to consider formally affiliating uh, in the near future. And we also anticipate bringing forward a deeper look at our responsible contractor policy in the coming year, including options for trustees to consider refining or updating to ensure that the policy is matching Lacera's expectations and objectives for the portfolio as, as it evolves. Uh, so with that, happy to take any other comments or questions. I have a question for you. Is there like a best in class uh, fund that when you look at ESG and kind of the real as asset category, you say, hey, they kind of really have a, a handle on it. Is there is there kind of someone in the that we're chasing or someone that we're, we're aspiring to, to get on the level with? Thanks for the, the question, Mr. Jones. I, I think what part of what we're trying to do is pull different pieces of what we think uh, could represent best in class and then combine it for a model that makes sense to Lucero. Uh, I think part of that means for us doing a top down and a bottom up approach. Uh, so the team is looking at both uh, uh, assessing the ESG approaches of each manager, uh, but then also doing some top down work, uh, looking at portfolio wide climate risks and opportunities, for example, working with the general investment consultant with Makita on stress testing, capital market assumptions uh, to understand what that might imply for future return expectations and volatility in future asset classes. So I, I, I think we see some of the opportunity in trying to be holistic, both bottom up and top down. And yes, that's informed by you know, what we're seeing from uh, some practices at, at peers here and there. Any other questions, uh, comments by the uh, trustees here? Okay. Um, thank you very much. That was very, uh, very thoughtful, uh, Scott, on that piece. Are there any other um, items for staff review? No, no items. Okay. And then uh, go to the order. Um, why don't you, John, I know you had mentioned it before the meeting. Why don't you go ahead and kick that off and then we'll see if anyone else has anything to add. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, trustees. Uh, we began the meeting with kind of a beginning uh, and the introduction of Mr. Miller, and not to sound like the lyrics from a, from a bad song, but maybe it's worth ending with an ending. And with that, I want to um, announce and thank Carol Quinn, who is the, you know, the, the voice of this meeting and our other committees, the secretary of the um, Corporate Governance Committee. Uh, Carol is retiring at the end of the month after over 14 years at La Serra. Um, you know, we all work here and we all oversee a portfolio for the benefit um, of our members. And so now we will all, you know, begin working for Carol to make sure um, <laughs> that she collects her, uh, her, her check uh, uninterrupted, uh, without any problems, um, but really want to thank Carol for um, helping us in the investment division. Uh, you know, we're somewhat of an unruly bunch and helping facilitate, gather all the, this information, uh, transmit it to the board uh, such that it's uh, useful, it could be interpreted. Um, so hopefully there are no hiccups over the next month, but um, I really want to wish Carol nothing but happiness, joy, success, uh, and, and an easy, uh, transition to retirement. Thank you, Carol, for everything. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'll miss you all, but excited to um, be retiring. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. All right. Any other um, good of the order if you want to go through the role there, Carol, and see. Okay. Mr. Got. Knox. Good morning. The changing of the guard officially begins at 9 a.m. Okay. Mrs. <laughs> Ms. Sanchez. I've got nothing, thanks. Uh, Mr. Green. And Chair Jones. Uh, none at all, except for no weight loss resolutions at all this year. <laughs> I plan to fatten up. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm right there with you, Patrick. <laughs>
All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, um, for being timely. Great job, uh, John and Jim and the entire uh, uh, staff, investment staff in the real estates category. Scott, thank you very much. And then uh, how much of a break did you want to give us between uh, this committee and the start of the full Five board? Minutes. We'll, we'll start sharp at uh, 9 a.m. Okay. All right. Thank you. See you shortly. Thank you.